thank you all for uh, attending uh, a lecture on a very timely to topic, uh, that is Afghanistan. And we have an excellent speaker, uh, David Lyon, who's uh, been a foreign correspondent for the BBC for over three decades uh, in most of the hot spots of the world, including um, Afghanistan. And um, he's here today to talk about his, his new book, uh, In Afghanistan. Uh, which focuses on the various adventures and misadventures um, that foreigners have found themselves uh, when dealing with the Afghans. Um, and it's, uh, for people who don't realize this, it goes back almost 200 years. So um, the United States and the problems that it's facing at the moment, whether they be military, political, or diplomatic, actually have uh, many precursors. But in a place like Afghanistan, one of the difficulties is trying to know which analogies apply where. Uh, because Afghanistan has so many of them that it's very easy to take a wrong pass. Uh, there are many battles in the Hindu Kush, there are only a couple that will take you from one side to another. And this is where expertise is really called for. And unfortunately, uh, now the media has focused on Afghanistan inside the United States. Uh, we are slogging through almost every dead end uh, that has been presented about Afghanistan uh, over the past 100 and 150 years. So I'm very pleased uh, uh, to have David uh, speak to us about Afghanistan. It'll be a relatively short talk. We'll open up for questions, and then we have uh, a reception afterwards um, that will allow for more personal questions and discussions. David? Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, it's uh, a week of anniversaries. It's on Wednesday this week. I think the uh, the ninth year of uh, since the U.S. Uh, led uh, uh, invasion, whatever you call it, of Afghanistan in 2001 happened after 9/11, and it is exactly 200 years ago this year, uh, 1809. Uh, the very first British envoy, a man with the with the name of the sort of names that we don't have anymore, a man called Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who was a brilliant young young Scottish um, diplomat, was sent to discover who ruled uh, Afghanistan. And at that time, uh, Britain had just taken India and uh, pretty well controlled Persia uh, on the other side of uh, this, what to them was then blank space on the map. And when Elphinstone met uh, Shah Shuja, the, the then ruler of Afghanistan, he found this extraordinarily powerful looking uh, character who was dressed in what looked to Elphinstone like a, a green suit of armor. In fact, it turned out to be studded with emeralds, this breastplate. And uh, around this man's wrist was uh, a bracelet, including a number of rocks, the biggest of them, the Koh i Noor diamond itself. So this was a king who had been used to being powerful. Afghanistan had uh, only recently um, invaded India. The British knew that. And so they went in to see who he was and to try and negotiate uh, with him. And that began um, a pretty miserable series of uh, relationships between uh, the British government and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, during the 19th century, and as a, a, a television correspondent, a trained initially as a historian, uh, and ha after travelling for years in Afghanistan, I began to ask, you know, just what it was about this country, whether there was something about Afghanistan that made it unconquerable, this sort of famous image that it has of uh, being a place that uh, no one can go into, and it's certainly true that it's an easier country to take uh, than it is to hold. Um, so uh, my researchers took me to the British Library where uh, a lot of the manuscripts uh, kept by um, uh, those extraordinary adventurers, Elton Stone and his successors in the 19th century, are kept. Um, and it goes right up to, uh, up to the present day, up to Obama's war, as this has really now become. And I want to talk uh, a little bit at the end about some of the foreign policy um, uh, possibilities that, uh, that the US led coalition could get into. But begin by uh, looking at uh, what lessons history might have taught us. You know, I'm the, I'm the reporter who says history's got lessons to teach. So, uh, what lessons are they? And I think, I think if in Afghanistan there are two Fs that we forget about at our peril. Uh, one is the frontier, and the other is fundamentalism. And uh, we often forget about, in particular, the geography of the country. It's easy nowadays when we fly over places uh, to forget just what's, what it's like on the ground underneath. And, and a country with, like yours, with a half trillion dollar defense budget also believes in the, in the extraordinary power of military will to prevail. Well now, as we've known, there's a terrible cost of, uh, of eight young Americans who died on the weekend uh, 
in Nuristan, a very similar place to where there was a similar attack uh, last year, high up in, um, in the mountains, natural guerrilla territory, in in fact a mountain range which to the Afghans should never have been divided. The British divided that frontier in 1893, drawing a, a, an unstable border down a mountain range which is 400 miles long and 200 miles wide. And some of the mountain passes go up to, some of the peaks go up to 16,000 feet. And there are really only three ways you can cross that mountain range. The most famous, of course, being the Khyber Pass, uh, the northernmost. There's a further one further south, which the British used to call the Camel's Neck. I think the uh, US uh, Army called it the Parrot's Beak, but it's a shape like a, uh, a parrot's beak that goes into Afghanistan at the Kuran Valley. And the southern one, the Bolan Pass, and the British, when they drew this border, us, um, brought the Bolan Pass into what was then British India, and leading the other two um, as ways into um, Afghanistan. And the whole of their policy during the 19th century was about controlling the tribes who ran the passes, didn't really care what happened in the mountains. If they'd been able to rule them, they would have done. Uh, Britain successfully planted its flag, as you know, wherever it wanted to in those days, but they failed in, the north, in what then became the northwest frontier of Pakistan. And I think we... We forget about um, uh, those mountains, and we forget too easily about the kind of people who live in them and live in a land, um, Afghanistan, which has less than 5% of the territory as irrigable ag agricultural land. The rest of Afghanistan is deserts and mountains. That, that extraordinary mountain range to the east that I described, and to the north, and it's a, it's a right angle of mountains, the Hindu Kush, which runs like a great barrier across <coughs> When you drive up from Kabul, you see these uh, mountains. You can't believe how high they are uh, that, that seem to rear out of the out of the plain. And the Hindu Kush is really the western end of the Himalayas, and it would go up through the tallest mountains in the world <coughs> across the top of uh, Pakistan and India. So, north of the Hindu Kush, there is still Afghanistan, but it feels like a very different country from the south of the country. Um, and I think uh, we forget about that land and the people it has created to our peril. Um, in fact, in 2001, there wasn't really even any, um, uh, any uh, curiosity about the kind of people who lived in Afghanistan. Francis <coughs> Vendrell, um, who was the first EU representative in Kabul, said in an interview on the BBC, when the occupying powers came in in 2001, uh, they knew there were various tribes within the Pashtun, but because there was a feeling that things were still going to become normal, it was not thought necessary for us to understand the tribal system. So I think uh, mistakes were made in terms of really identifying who these people were and where they came from. And mistakes were made in particular in, uh, since then in not understanding the kind of people who lived in the, in, in the northwest frontier itself. Of course, we drew a border down those mountains, but for the Pashtuns on the east and west of it, uh, it's, it, it, it's not a border for them. Uh, they, it's natural guerrilla territory, both for the new Pakistani Taliban and for uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan itself. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you if you read uh, Duran's notes, the this, the British uh, Indian Foreign Secretary who drew the frontier, he was very optimistic. He, he said uh, that Bajor and Bunar will cease to have any horrors for us soon, and we will we will begin, begin to take annual revenue from the Waziris. Um, even in Swat Valley, um, uh, British rule will, will, will prevail. Well, as you know, anyone who's been reading the newspapers recently, Bajor, Bunar, Swat, and Waziristan are the key places of unrest that the Pakistani army have lost thousands of, uh, of young soldiers in trying to take. So, you know, th we, in those days, didn't really learn what was going on. Um, the other F uh, that uh, I, I mentioned, of course, is, is fundamentalism. Um, uh, everyone knew in 2001 that uh, Afghanistan had been a difficult country, that the graveyard empire and all the sorts of uh, cliches that emerged, and that Britain had been decisively beaten there in the 19th century. But what, one of the things that was missed was a history that was known about, um, uh, I mean, my government missed it as, as well as anyone else, that, that really far from being a unique aberration in Afghanistan, the Taliban represented a significant strand in the country, um, a country which had turned often uh, to fundamentalist Islam as a nationalist rallying cry, going right back, in fact, to um, 
the 1830s, the Sikhs, who were the first people to try and take the northwest frontier, um, found themselves up against Wahhabi warriors, inspired by just the same uh, Islamic fundamentalist um, view that uh, the Taliban are themselves. Um, when the, the, the British went to try and take Afghanistan for the first time in 1838, uh, um, the man that they tried to put on the throne was Shah Shuja, who was this, this same character that they, they, uh, they, they first met back in 1809. He finally lost the throne and lost the Kerry North Diamond, but Britain believed that he was the person who uh, they could properly install. Um, and uh, his uh, adversary, Dost Mohammed, um, had declared the battle against the British to be a jihad, and he went to a mosque in Kandahar, which is the, where they keep the most sacred relic in the country, uh, a cloak believed to belong to the Holy Prophet Muhammad himself. And Dost Muhammad drapes himself in this cloak, declares himself Amir al Muminin, leader of all the Muslims, not just king of Afghanistan, and so uh, declares this war to be a jihad, so people who die in the war will go directly to heaven. Now, the next person to take that cloak out of the box in Kandahar and display it to the population and declare himself Amir al Muminin, as we know, is um, uh, Mullah Ramar in the spring of 1996, six months before he took Kabul. So that direct link between um, the Islamic <coughs> fundamentalist creed from the 1830s and the 1990s was made um, by the Afghans. And they remember that history as we don't. Uh, young Taliban warriors are recruited today in the South by people saying, do you want to be remembered as a son of Shah Shuja or a son of Dost Mohammed? And of course in their model, Shah Shuja is the puppet imposed by the foreigners, to the present, present president Karzai, and Dost Mohammed is their leader, Mullah Ramar. There's a lot of excellent research into this uh, material in a, in a wonderful book written by a, a friend of mine, Charles Allen, called God's Terrorists, who draws the Wahhabi roots from Saudi Arabia through South Asia um, right up to the present day. Um, the opponents in those days even uh, used the same terminology. The earliest use of the word Talib, Taliban that I could discover as, as a word for a religious warrior was 1880, an attack on a, a British soldier in Kandahar Fort. And in the 1897 frontier war, the young Winston Churchill, later of course British Prime Minister, who was a precocious and brilliant young foreign correspondent, war correspondent, took time off from the Indian Army where he was a, an officer to uh, report on that war. And he discovered that Taliban among the enemy, that they were the toughest of the warriors, the ones most willing to lay down their lives. Um, and he said uh, they lived free at the expense of the people, rather similar, I suppose, in the way to the way that the, the Taliban operate in, in the south of Afghanistan today, as I discovered when I spent time with them a couple of years ago. So where did this conservative fundamentalist undercurrent go in Afghanistan after 1900, after, after the frontier war? It didn't sort of disappear. It was always a standard that Afghans could rally around. And of course, in the 1980s, that was exactly what uh, the USA used in terms of funding and financing um, the Mujahideen uh, fighters in a jihad. And all of the Mujahideen leaders who were funded in those days had been fundamentalist leaders in the 1970s. Masood and Hekmati were actually expelled from Afghanistan in the early 1970s, many who later became uh, resistance heroes against the Russians. They've been expelled as being too fundamentalist. They tried to lead a students' union at uh, Kabul University and Technical College and found themselves thrown out of the country. So in the 1980s, Afghanistan had turned to fundamentalist Islam well before the years of the Taliban. Um, the Taliban were a more purist continuation of something that had begun much before. Um, the communists have destroyed the old courts, they destroyed the social system, so the Mujahideen empowered Muslim clerics to administer justice in their, way, in their place. In the 1980s this was going on, not in the 1990s when the Taliban emerged. The French anthropologist Olivier Roy, who travelled in Panjshir in 1985, wrote, the resistance movement has brought with it a strengthening of Islam's role in shaping the social order. So Sharia made sense of the chaos that the country was in. Women's clothing didn't disappear from public display in shops. Women weren't cast into burqas in the cities in the days of the Taliban. Of course, it became more extreme then. But in the earlier years, 
and the majority were then financed by the US. The, the, those, uh, those warlords who became US allies um, in 2001, the same ones who they funded in the 1980s and returned in 2001, were the very people who had done most, in a sense, to uh, take Afghanistan back into this much more fundamentalist kind of, um, of lifestyle. And the meaning of all of this history was lost in the years um, after 9-11. Uh, the Taliban were, understandably, having been the hosts of those who brought down the Twin Towers, made to suffer for it. Um, but the understand that the, this understanding emerged that the Taliban were uniquely evil and that the Mujahideen the US had financed in the 1980s were, were somehow uniquely good. And I think both ends of that were, were wrong and were, were led to a real problem in, in understanding both for the media and for the political class in this country, understanding exactly what was really going on in Afghanistan. And it meant that uh, uh, Taliban were not included in any sense as uh, interlocutors in any negotiations that happened after 2001. They were completely excluded. Um, and uh, this country ended up not being generous enough with its defeated foe, nor skeptical enough of its allies. And I think those, both ends of that equation uh, have led to some of the problems that we um, face today. And I think that explains in many ways why the country was so hard to settle after 2001. Uh, in the early days since then, the Taliban found it hard to recruit um, because the American forces were popular, millions of refugees returned, um, there was a, a view of a completely different kind of country. But because of the extreme corruption of the uh, Karzai administration, because of the ineffectiveness of the aid program, um, much of it worthy, but uh, too much of it um, really ineffective, that didn't create an Afghan state, but rather a parallel state. Um, the World Bank have been very critical of this. They talk about an, an aid juggernaut emerging um, in Kabul. And uh, <clears throat> they said, you know, in fact, in a report last year, the World Bank wrote that the prominent foreign presence in Afghanistan undermines the very objective of building a credible and legitimate Afghan state. So it's not only ineffective, it's actually damaging, according to you know, the aid professionals. So rather than building a state that people wanted, um, uh, much of the aid was, uh, was, went into the wrong directions. And if you talk to people, as I have in Afghan villages, quite close to Kabul, about why they're supporting the Taliban again, the answer is because um, they have to pay for justice from Karzai's police. They have to pay for justice if they have a dispute with their neighbor. And the Taliban um, administer a simpler and rougher, you might not like it, but a simpler kind of justice. Um, and, it, and that single thing has made them popular. Uh, and the other big issue that people talk about is, is land rights and land title, um, which has been corruptly mismanaged since 2001, despite a rather brave effort by USAID in a program that's now been roll back, in fact, to, um, to re-register all of this land. You can imagine the competing claims for land after 30 years of, uh, of war. If you buy a plot of land in Kabul, there isn't a, a real market. It's, you don't get a guaranteed piece of paper that uh, uh, gives you a right of title. You trust that the man who sold it to you um, has the right to, to sell it to you in the first place. Now, all of that could have been uh, sorted out, but those are the things that matter to Afghans. That's the boring daily grind stuff that uh, that they really that they really need. It's not the you know the 40,000 more U.S. soldiers that is the real uh, issue for, for for most Afghan people. It's not. In fact, uh, if you read General McChrystal's material, it's not the number of troops that he cares about most. It is actually now a, a completely different strategy. We can, I'm sure talk about this in questions for uh, counterterrorism. Um, in Afghanistan to, to genuinely <coughs> rebuild a country respecting the people um, and uh, the rule of law. Well, before I uh, break for questions, I just wanted to, having sort of gone, raced back through the past and uh, talked about the lessons that we might have learned, in particular the, 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 the lesson that we, uh, I believe, you know, didn't at the time properly respect uh, that history and properly understand it. Um, I just want to run through <coughs> like a, the, the ten things that I think really matter in terms of, uh, of, of rebuilding the country. And the first one, uh, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, having heard me talk about 
we weren't generous enough, is to talk to the Taliban. Um, that, I think, is an essential part of any durable peace. Uh, durable peace comes from negotiating with your enemy. It's not from trying to break away moderates. If people who lay down their arms and come over your side are not that much good, um, uh, durable peace comes by negotiating between the toughest of people. And that's uh, what uh, we in Britain discovered in, during the Northern Ireland uh, peace talks. I mean, I, you can't necessarily impose a model from one to another. But uh, I think the, the present Saudi Arabian negotiations, which are beginning to come to something, are beginning to get some political traction around them, which are happening with genuine Taliban leadership, people who are talking to the Taliban leadership, are absolutely the right way forward. Um, and secondly, uh, corruption is um, a huge problem for Afghanistan and we will never create strong armed forces or police um, in that country without dealing with the, with the corruption issue and that will take a generation um, the warlords have not always been there um, but there are some simple things that are happening at the moment for example the police at the moment uh, who get supposedly get paid about $200 a month uh, generally get about 100 or 130 of it because it gets creamed off by different people all the way down the line. So when it comes to the individual police officer, he gets about 100 dollars, about half of his salary. When, how, how motivated do you think that makes him? Um, so there's been a, a uh, experimental scheme, and I think it's going to roll out in, in more provinces, what, particularly because of the effectiveness of it, for uh, the police to be able to draw their salary by putting a PIN number in on their mobile phone, uh, which is 21st century technology jumping um, the, uh, the, the, the potential for the state to be corrupt. So it's that kind of issue, the bread and butter complexity, that if we get it right, then you could potentially turn around this, um, this corruption problem. And my third of my ten points um, is to protect better middle-ranking uh, non-corrupt Afghans, which we've been really bad at since uh, 2001. It's been uh, shameful how uh, really good individuals um, living in very difficult conditions, many of them returned refugees, have been hung out to dry by the uh, foreign forces. They've not been, uh, it's not just security protection, but backing them up when the state tries to sack them um, and supporting them in, in what they're doing. There are a large number of very good Afghans who um, have lost their jobs and some of their lives. Um, who, because the international community didn't understand the value of the jobs that they were doing. Um, number four is to Afghanize the aid program. Uh, not uh, one of the, the things you don't hear so much about the Obama plan now. In the spring, when Obama put his plan together, he talked about hundreds of thousands of, of US citizens going to Afghanistan as agricultural uh, experts and judges and going along the side of civilian surge going to, to, to mentor Afghans. Uh, personally, I think that would be disastrous. It's the last thing the country needs. Respect the Afghans better to do, do the job um, for themselves, um, spend money on, on building bits of the Afghan state. And you know, number five, that means encouraging the institutions of the state beyond the Karzai nexus. You know, President Karzai is a mafia leader in, 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 in some ways. Um, uh, the, the kind of effect of what he's doing is to create a a, a really a, a, a criminal class that can only survive by continuing to do the kinds of things it's doing. But there are some ministries that are not entirely within that control, and if we were skillful at the same time as, as uh, take, taking a far tougher political line against him, um, uh, if we were skillful in building those, those ministries, then we could potentially um, do the country much better. Um, uh, number, number six is to encourage the private sector, which may do far more than any government uh, institution. Uh, I mentioned mobile phones. The mobile phone system is run by uh, mostly Canadian uh, ex-Afghans, but there are large numbers of bits of, of, of Afghanistan which, you know, this is the, this is the country <coughs> of, 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 of private uh, entrepreneurship, um, and uh, it's something that uh, Afghanistan could do much more of, do with much more of. Uh, number seven, um, land rights, rule of law, uh, justice, things that really matter to individual Afghans, um, but particularly uh, the land rights issue, which again and again we talk to, there's a, there's a rather wonderful anti-corruption MP called uh, Ramzan, a member of parliament, 
Ramsden and Fashion Goss to, who lives in a tent, um, initially in a public park, and he's actually moved his tent, you've probably seen him, he's moved <coughs> his tent now to near Parliament, right by a rather busy road, but he was in the public park, it has a sort of bucolic feel to it. Um, and he was a candidate in the election, and in fact he came third. He did a really um, um, poll far more votes than uh, anyone, I think, uh, in the international community expected, because he's non not corrupt, and... Uh, he works tirelessly. He's lost about a stone. He looks, looks more and more like Gandhi every time I see him. He's sort of uh, darker skin because he's out so much campaigning and you know, doesn't eat. And he's living in his tent. And when you go and see him, you just spend the afternoon with Bashar Dost. And individuals come and tell him their stories of how you know, a warlord came and you know, took their land and how you know, the Taliban had protected them before uh, this warlord came. But you know, this is Karzai's warlord. And let me, those are the. Um, uh, particularly the, the land rights issues are the things that really matter to, uh, to individual Afghans. Number uh, eight is respect. Um, it's a word that General McChrystal used in his speech in London last week, which was a really interesting read, um, uh, where he talked, uh, he's been talking a lot about protecting the people, but in this speech he, he focused that what he really means by that is respecting them, and I think that's something that you know, we as an international community have not done very well in Afghanistan. And it's about respecting individuals, but you know, US forces are getting much better at it, rebuilding mosques, get doing things in ways that are, are um, uh, sympathetic to, to, to local people. But um, you know, we could be more active with that. For example, there was a program put together by the Afghan government a couple of years ago to fund reform, reform of the madrasa system. Now, is, is he, anyone who knows a little about the country knows that uh, many students spend many of their early years learning the Quran by rote, and uh, and the, the actual madrasa uh, syllabus beyond that is, is, is pretty simplistic. You know, when they learn science, uh, the curriculum stopped in the 15th century. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when you think of how much science has changed in the last 10 years, let alone the last you know 500 years, um, uh, it's th those those are. Madra those madrasas are a problem. And the Afghan uh, education minister tried to uh, in interest the international community in funding a reform program. Got no interest at all. What, why would anyone want to <coughs> build new madrasas? Um, but actually, when he went into the kinds of things he was doing, they were uh, spending half of their time learning English, learning computers, doing modern science. Um, and that's the kind of program which, uh, because it didn't appear on any UN um, that scheme, you couldn't put in money in, in, in any aid sector to fund reform of, of, uh, of something that the international community thought was just producing more Taliban. But I went, when I, I did a, a, a BBC report about this reform program, we went into a, one of the unreformed madrasas where the, the principal of this school said, um, it's a real problem because uh, my young men are going across the frontier for proper madrasa education in, in Pakistan, which is, remains still the, in a way, the biggest threat and the biggest problem. Uh, number nine is to coordinate the international effort. Now, this seems to be simple, but when you have the, the most senior American in the country, uh, Peter Galbraith, uh, being fired, the most senior civilian American um, outside the, the US government system, being fired because, he, because he, he put his hand up and said, we must take a far tougher line on corruption in the election, fraud in the election, you have a, a, a really broken uh, international system. Um, Kai Haider, the, the head of the UN, you know, has, has I think, been proved and found wanting um, for the things that he has, he's done in the country. Um, uh, Galbraith wasn't just talking about uh, uh, any, a, a few little bits of fraud on the side. He was talking about the fact that votes were being counted from polling stations that we know were closed on polling day. Um, so, why couldn't they have been discounted right at the beginning? Why didn't the United Nations make a big fuss about this? And he was told to keep quiet. And he has uh, he's been sacked. We read a really good piece in yesterday's Washington Post uh, explaining uh, why he why he tried to do what he did. But the international aid effort is uncoordinated because President Karzai likes it that way. He prevented the British government from appointing. Um, former high representative in Bosnia, Paddy Ashdown, who's a substantial British politician with uh, 
um, a proven international track record and a man who wanted to go in and really bring the uh, coordinate the system between military and civilian. He's a former soldier and, for, and former politician. He wanted to bring the two sides together in a much better way. And, uh, uh, and President Karzai successfully vetoed his appointment. Uh, number 10 is, I guess, more troops, but um, that's not the biggest issue. In order to, to run any kind of counterinsurgency efforts using conventional mathematics of counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, you need three to 400,000 troops, given the size of the country and the size of the population. So the difference between 50 or 90, 120, 130,000 is not huge. Um, more effective troops, troops doing a better job, troops respecting the population, troops um, uh, working to train and educate um, armed forces of Afghanistan. All of that you know, might work better. And destroying less property would be a good thing. The, the British forces have a, have a slightly distasteful phrase for uh, what they tend to do in Helmand during every summer during the, the, the fighting season, which is called mowing the lawn. And of course, you know, when you cut the grass, it, grow, it grows back, and they, they know that that happens. Basically, you take a village and they try and control it, but they don't have enough people to hold the ground. But you need so many more people than is, is possible. And that's one area where, when you look back at the Russian records, as I did, of what happened in the 1980s, where the Russians failed in exactly the same way. It's now, do you pull back to 30,000 troops and pull back just to the towns and, uh, and effectively abandon the countryside for the Taliban? Well, I think that would be a mistake. I think it's both hands. But if you don't do all the boring stuff, the land rights, corruption, um, and, uh, and really trying to revise and, and, and build um, some kind of an Afghan state, then, um, uh, then it's not winnable. Um, but uh, perhaps we could move on to some questions and uh, have a debate. Yeah, on that. We, we went to war eight years ago against Al Qaeda. And you haven't mentioned it yet tonight. What's the relationship between Al Qaeda and the Taliban? Al Qaeda were invited into Afghanistan uh, by the Eastern Shura in Jalalabad, who were the people who predated the Taliban in 1996. Uh, Osama bin Laden had run out of other places to go, um, and he arrived in, in uh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan uh, used him to uh, fund, to train. They set him up. They remember who he was. He, as you know, Osama bin Laden had been in, in the region as a, as a major fundraiser during the uh, during the Russian war in the 1980s um, and he'd come back and the Pakistanis remembered him and they set him up with some training camps initially to train Kashmiri militants um, and Kashmir and is, is, is the key to all this actually because I was travelling as a reporter in Kashmir a lot in the early 90s and uh, all of a sudden the Indians realised that the war had changed and the Indian security forces noticed among the people they were capturing uh, some far tougher individuals who, who'd come and the Kashmiri militants that I spoke to complained of this as well. They complained that they were now being used as supporters by people who didn't want uh, just independence for Kashmir, but once it had this far different program of sort of global jihad, of a, of a global world order. So that was the son of Bin Laden. The Taliban then took the east of the country. And uh, Muramar had a problem because uh, he had this individual who clearly had a different kind of objective to what uh, the, the, the Taliban had. They're, they're very different kind of people and don't believe the CIA's propaganda that, that uh, Osama bin Laden married Mullah Mal's son in or the other way around. Or, and they go fishing together and all these stories that you hear. And, and, uh, as far as I know, um, uh, from people close to Mullah Mal's family, I, I've only met Mullah Mal once, but I, I wouldn't say it was a very detailed conversation. But as far as I, I understand what's happened South Afghanistan. The, the links are, you know, and weren't in those days very close. Now, I'm going to go back to some of that history because after the Taliban took Afghanistan in 1996, um, the Salman Laden became much stronger. Clearly, by 2001, he had four or five houses in Kabul. There were Arab Afghans all over the place. There were a number of Uzbeks who were allied to, um, and Chinese Uyghurs and Chechens who were allied to. Um, uh, to uh, Osama bin Laden, who were pretty well ran around the place um, at will. And the power of, uh, of Al-Qaeda six months before 
was shown when, when the uh, bullets of Bamiyan were successfully destroyed at their orders, which no Afghan leader would have, uh, would have ordered. Um, but that showed how, sort of, if, if you like, how extreme the movement had become. But, uh, but even <coughs> then, um, uh, you know, the Taliban did not see um, uh, world domination as being one of their aims. The Taliban were and are a nationalist Afghan, fundamentalist nationalist Afghan group whose only uh, desire is peace and security under Sharia law in Afghanistan. They've become allied with um, um, Al-Qaeda and they clearly got a lot of support and a lot of fighters, Al-Qaeda fighters who go, go and fight for them, both in the Northwest Frontier now against Pakistani forces and in Afghanistan itself. But the key to any kind of you know, uh, unmeshing of this and foreign policy uh, solution has to be to try and negotiate with reconcilables. I mean, the difference is that clearly Al Qaeda are irreconcilable. They have a view um, that is that you, that, that they, and, and a desire, physical aim, that is not you can't negotiate with. Whereas the Taliban, you know, wants some part of. I don't, I'm not saying it's easy to negotiate with the Taliban. I don't think it'd be easy at all. But, as I said before, you negotiate with your enemy. You, you make durable peace with people at the hardest end. So, I mean, it's, a, it's a slightly long historical answer, but uh, I think they have become more and more aligned in recent years, mostly because of mistakes of uh, international foreign policy. If the Taliban had been recognised as, as an, an administration in Afghanistan in 1996, Al Qaeda would not have achieved the, uh, the success that they did because that. They, that Taliban movement in the Taliban death or Afghanistan became completely excluded from the international community. I was curious how organized or centralized or coordinated the Taliban are now? Or a lot have a lot of local leaders, new leaders, old leaders set forward and are using that name, but there's not necessarily a lot of coordination or cohesion. It's both and. I mean there is still a, a central group called the Taliban to, who owe allegiance to Nur Omar, who run a sort of parallel administration. I've seen their military commanders in a couple of provinces taking orders on. They use, um, uh, I was very struck, I, I spent a few days with them in 2006, uh, 2007, 2007, in, in near, near, um, near Mr. Kala, at a time when they were taking on British forces. Um, Rob complicated things to negotiate both from my employers at the BBC and, and, with, the, and with the Taliban. But once I got these two sort of giant groups to, to agree terms of engagement, um, you know, I went in and, and uh, spent some time with them and I was struck by their, uh, by their control, by the, the loyalty that they had for the <coughs> villagers. Uh, yes, they, when we moved at night, we took, we, they moved to another house every night, but with their main military commander, who was killed by the British about three months later, targeted and killed um, uh, by a, a missile coming down his chimney at night, which is exactly the thing that I most feared. And during the time I, I spent with them, uh, when they when they moved, they they lived on the people in, in the sense that they take their food, but they paid for their fuel when we stopped at a, at a petrol station, um, and their, their local commanders. And uh, he went around, the, the one the local leader I, I spent time with went around completely unarmed. He seemed to be, he was like a local politician anywhere. Uh, I don't believe he was someone who was just with the Taliban for the moment. I think he was doctrinally you know, a Taliban. So, so, so there is absolutely a movement you know, called the Taliban who owe allegiance to Mura Omar and, and take his orders. But there are lots of other things that go on. Uh, that are carried out by criminal gangs, and they're increasingly being financed by uh, poppy crop. I mean, I haven't talked about drugs at all, but uh, they're increasingly being financed by that, as, as indeed the, the government is. Um, and uh, once you have criminality and corruption in any insurgent group, and it's happened before, it happened in Colombia, then you get you get much more criminality banditry, and uh, you, you move. It's happened also. Maoist groups in India in the same way. They, they move away from the idealism of, of the origins of the movement towards being a, um, you know, just a, another, another criminal gang. So if you read, um, I mean, there have been a couple of very good reports by the ICG, the International Crisis Group, who have 
plotted this, these, the way that these criminal gangs have sort of have used the name Taliban in order to, in order sometimes to carry out the same kind of attacks. Um, but we sometimes get uh, uh, phone calls at the BBC from the Taliban spokesman saying that girls' school that was burnt down, that, that wasn't us. You know, we don't know who did that. Um, so you know, denying uh, culpability for things that are, that are carried out, but, but that are political acts that look like the kind of thing that they might do. So um, the answer is it's becoming very complicated. But as the Americans are in the field for longer, there are more and more of the old warlords um, coming back in the field uh, with them, and they have their own uh, people who are loyal to them. I mean, Hakani in particular, and Hakani's son, who's now who's now fighting an extraordinarily Gulbuddin Hakmatyar, who's still still a guerrilla leader, you know, um, and has been. I mean, he's, he, he he was trained by the Pakistanis in 1975, and uh, and he's still you know, in the field as a as a, as a significant guerrilla leader. Mostly allied with Mullah Ramar. He says he owes allegiance to him, but you know, Mullah Ramar doesn't either, doesn't control the Pakistani Taliban. And he, there was a meeting at the beginning of last year in the northwest frontier when the Pakistani Taliban became properly organized. And uh, they, the, 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 the readout that I had from it was that they said uh, that Mullah Ramar said, said to them, uh, We don't want you to take on the Pakistani. State, we've got, you know, we've got a country to take. It's Afghanistan, and we want all of the effort to go into that. As it went from the northwest frontier and from Pakistan into the, the war against the Russians and the Maginates, and these leaders were by now strong enough to say, no, we're going to fight our own, our own campaign here. We're going to try and take the Swat Valley as they subsequently did during, during that year. Um, so, it's a complicated picture. Um, but there is a group called the Taliban that could be that remains you know, negotiating. The ability to negotiate peace in place behind you. Could you speak a little bit about the uh, the election and um, a couple of points about it? <coughs> First of all, um, can you nail down for me what the the independent electoral commission's uh, relationship was to UNAMA and then to the Afghan? Afghan government. I have the impression that it is a lot of, of people who don't owe a primary loyalty to the Afghan government. And secondly, um, the, the conventional wisdom now seems to be, well, Karzai has won. Is there, there is no room for um, a, a possible uh, second round any longer. Is that correct? Well, I think it's that very briefly, the, the second part is becoming less and less life. And that no one other than really wants it, um, um, and, and of course, and, and his people. Um, I mean, on the you know the way the election was 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 run, um, it's looking more and more as if it wasn't just the the, the, the box stumping and the count itself that were corrupt, but the, the register, the registration process at the beginning. So the Independent Election Commission, who are all Karzai appointees and and uh, operates. Um, uh, you know, completely uh, within the Afghan context, or they you know, describe, describe relations with the UN. Um, but they carried out um, uh, all of the acts that might be engaged in running a fraudulent election from, from the very beginning. Now, <coughs> there is an international oversight group um, which has got five uh, members, three of them foreign and two, uh, two Afghans, that, that the five commissioners. And they have been uh, more and more um, uh, aggressive and assertive in, in, and robust, really, in, in declaring you know, that, that, that there should be, they were the people who ordered more of a recount than the, than the IEC wanted um, and uh, have been pushing it very hard. And there, there was a rather strange political game that went on over, over a week or so, um, three weeks ago. I mean, I was, they had this daily press conference and they were announcing another 10% of the count every day. The, the, the day would come when Karzai had gone above the 50%, and they wanted to get to that point so that there was, in a sense, a political wheel that moved significantly in Karzai's direction once they announced that. Um, they wanted to be able to do that before there was any serious scrutiny. And this, the, 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 the foreign-dominated um, um, oversight body um, 
wrote a, a, a letter you know, requesting certain specifics that they want to change, um, and it was sent back to them by the IEC, who said it hadn't been properly translated. Um, so that was another two-day delay. And so any sensible organisation would have phoned up and said, you know, on paragraph three, do you mean 100 or do you mean 100 percent? Which is the which is the issue of the translation. Um, but it was, that, it was all part of this, this game, really, if you like, between these two these two bodies. But now I think. I think we've now moved to the point where there's almost certainly not going to be a second round, uh, barring you know, some some really major change. And uh, so that does mean that President Karzai is now committed to uh, the promise he made that on the first day after uh, being declared president again, he would talk to the Taliban. Um, and he is clearly going to have a very significant uh, different relationship with uh, the US. Uh, embassy in Kabul in particular. Um, he cares little, in fact, is uh, assertively opposed to anything that the British say to him, for a variety of historical reasons, which I'm sure are reasonable. What do you mean by a different relationship? Well, well I, think, I think, it's, I think the, 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 the US embassy is going to speak to the and say, look, you know, you, you, you run a uh, two class administration and that's going to change. Um, the Afghan government, the early years of this government, Succeeded in raising less revenue than the Taliban had done in their in their latter years, and the Taliban didn't run a um, they didn't run a particularly sophisticated administration, but they didn't run a bad administration. They raised customs revenues, um, and they you know they were interested in in uh, um, the economy thriving. Uh, they were quite interested in getting oil pipeline deals arranged. In fact, they had a representative in Washington for most of their administration negotiating with Unical, um, who would certainly have, uh, they were only interested in security, they weren't interested in who ran the country, you know, what sort of colour they were. So they were, they were, you know, they weren't just, you know, psychopathic guys who were locking up women and, and carrying out uh, executions at the football stadium every Friday afternoon to entertain the, 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 the general public. They were actually running a sort of an administration, in some ways more competent than the one that succeeded them. Um, and, you know, the Karzai government has uh, it about the same Portion of its revenues uh, from the international community as the most um, dysfunctional African country, um, and we don't get very much leverage for our money um, because the international community has, has, has stayed back from that. But I think that's going to change. Yeah. Uh, you distinguish between sort of real and uh, fake Taliban. Could you say something about the Taliban and hears about North of England? Yeah. Uh, well, well, we know. I, well, I, mean, I, I, I don't know personally, um, but I think you're. I think you're right that there's, there are more. I haven't travelled up there for. I haven't been up there for five or six years, and certainly the fact that there are Taliban in Kunduz, um, as as powerful as they are, and as powerful to be able to carry out this kidnap that they did at the at New York Times here and Stephen Farrell that did awful consequences of his, uh, his Afghan colleagues sort of Nadi being killed by the British in a, in a botched uh, rescue uh, effort. Um, but the fact that they were there and had roadblocks during the day on the main road in Kunduz was, I think, a surprise to a lot of people. Um, my, my judgment is that they are, they're, they're, they're not as strong as they are in the south, but these are, in the old Afghan way, local tribal leaders who are, for the moment, going across to um, to the Taliban because they seem to be the more powerful uh, group. But there, there is a very significant number of Pashtuns in the north, which we, we forget about, um, actually trans transplanted by Abdul Rahman at the end of the 19th century when he was trying to create a multi-ethnic society. It was a forcible transplant of thousands of Pashtuns to north of Hindu Kush. And um, so there is, there is the, 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 the significant potential for the Taliban to operate there, but they were always very different group in the, in the late 90s. I mean, taking the Zara Sharif was extremely difficult for them, and the, most, the worst of the, of the attacks that they carried out against um, uh, um, people in the north, and the worst attacks carried out by the Taliban during their rule were in, as the Zara Sharif changed hands twice during 1996 and 1997. I remember that because I was came close to being killed on several occasions uh, during, during the fall of Mazar Sharif than, uh, than pretty well any other 24 hour period of my life. But, um, but uh, So I think uh, the, the answer is I, I, I don't know for sure, but my, my judgment is that they're less, um, um, 
aligned to, uh, to absolutely to a sort of do doctrinal um, future for the country um, than, than some others. They may be more fair with the friends, more of a sort of moderate Taliban of, the, of uh, a British and American the British American belief is the American intelligence belief. Um, yeah. Uh, some folks uh, say that there would be a model for the Taliban that was sort of like this, that, that the, the ideologues, certain percentage of the ideologues, maybe there's some um, gangs as well, and then there's a percentage of the Taliban that um, are in, in that camp because they're so opposed to the uh, Karzai government. And then there's a whole swath of people in between that just simply need a job and are, are, are paid to carry out whatever it is. Yeah, I don't agree with that analysis. I mean, I've heard that. Um, I, I think because the, the danger of that is that you, the, there's a very strong, that, that's very much the British view. They talk about $10 a day in Taliban. In fact, there's a, there's a senior British general, a called Graham Land, who's just gone to Kabul to carry out the very job that he carried out in Iraq, which was to negotiate with local uh, leaders, uh, much of the much of the, of the heavy lifting in terms of arranging the Iraq deal in Anbar province was carried out, in, in fact, by uh, by General uh, General Lamb, and he um, he very much sees this as as, as being the, the way forward. That there are lots of uh, unemployed young men, um, and the key is to to give them jobs. Um, now, that may be true in places like Kunduz, it may be true potentially in the north, but I, I don't think it's true in the south. And certainly the, the Taliban that I spent time with three years ago, um, um, it's very difficult to you know, have a, a very in-depth conversation with somebody through. Uh, I, I mean, I have a very, very good translator, but you know, at a time when you're completely under their control, that's sort of embedded with them. Um, but my judgment with them was that they were all ex-madrasa students and uh, they would not compromise um, for anything short of um, Afghanistan re-emerging under some kind of Sharia law. Uh, so you know, they, they're, they have this ideological, that the group, the, the number of Taliban who are ideologically um, uh, implacable or ideologically uh, very much on the side of um, a, a far tougher kind of Wahhabi system in Afghanistan than uh, that exists at the moment is, I think, much bigger than in the than, than the British intelligence analysis is. But you know, let's see if it's true. I mean, if you can provide employment um, and you can uh, weed off some of the local leaders, and certainly it worked actually when the British retook the town of Masakala in, in Northern Helm, there was a, a Taliban commander who changed sides and has remained, you know, on the British side. I don't know how many people he carries with him, but Masakala remains in in British hands, and it was the one significant town that was in. Taliban hands for about a year. So, um, you know, there are places where it's worked. Uh, I, I think that the jigsaw is so complicated. There are one and a half million extra, you know, the Taliban's not a fixed group, there are one and a half million extra Madrasa students coming across potentially all the time, uh, never ending source of, 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 of new young fighters um, who, who um, are not there for $10 a day, they're there because they. Uh, because they want to build a Sharia law and and or, in fact, most of the acts get martyred in the process because they think that's a, a pretty safe way to handle it. Um, a woman. <laughs> um, would you say then that it would be possible for the Taliban to accept a more moderate form of Sharia law? Well, I think... Rather than the kind of very fundamental rule they had earlier, but a more moderate... I'm not, I'm just going to speak to again how the negotiations might work, but the, but the Saudi Arabian negotiations that are going on at the moment are working towards some kind of an Islamic settlement, something that looks like, you know, a, a much more Islamic country than I think um, uh, the United States thought they were building or thought they, were, they might be the, the, the solution um, back in 2001. Um, and I mean, what tends to happen in all of these places is if there's disorder, um, you tend to get far tougher, far, far more fundamentalist kind of um, opportunities. Um, and where there is, I think it's going to be quite difficult to rebuild women's rights in Afghanistan, but it will come about through the cities. It will come about through security in, in the towns, and then through education, and then through um, women from the countryside 
um, you know, changing their ways in the way that as it as it as it spreads out. But I don't think it's um, it's going to be a very quick uh, job. <coughs> but, uh, yeah, question related to that actually because um, in the West on Dutch, so the war is sold to us as we're going there to the women's rights, etc. Huge, is it? And I have to remember the political element in your country is possibly pretty well anywhere else. Right. Right. It's been on the front pages for yeah. years now, and it's heating up. Yeah. So, since it sounds like Sharia law is the end goal, well, anyway, what's going to emerge in your opinion? How are you going to sell it to your politicians? How are your politicians going to sell it to your people? Two and ten young Dutch men have died in, in to. to uh, and why say that, if that is the end goal? Because it was September 11, Al-Qaeda, in which that, that wasn't there is that this Well, because, so, okay, well, my personal view is that um, the international community in the United States has a moral responsibility towards stabilizing the transfer of the place, um, going back to the funding in the 1980s, um, as well as uh, invading the country in 2001. So even though it's a really difficult job, I don't think that uh, pulling out is the answer. I think it was a problem that political. You know, this week it's, it's on all the talk shows and on the front pages, and next week it'll be something else. And there's, there's, there's a political impatience. And one of the wonderful, most wonderful things about America is the way that every day everything starts fresh. But, you know, that's equally one of the disturbing things about it, that you know, this is a potentially a very long-term game. Um, I mean, the senior British general came out last year in a in an interview and said this is, this is a 30 year project, the politicians really want to do that. That's how long the British forces would expect to be in Afghanistan for. And that's how long like, a counterinsurgency is. And things like rebuilding um, the, the sort of trust that women can have in order to uh, be able to operate uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more you know, fair way is something that takes a long time, takes a generation actually to do. Um, so, I mean, my answer to your, your politicians is that it's a real problem. I mean, um, but we're beginning to move towards a time when success and failure in Afghanistan look rather the same. You know, we haven't built Virginia and Hindu Kush, um, and so there is going to be some kind of you know, Afghan solution that's going to emerge, and it may not be absolutely to everybody's taste uh, what it looks like. But Al Qaeda has not been defeated by. You know, knocking down the Taliban in 2001. Um, there have been a number, as you know, of um, terrorist attacks in, in, in Britain over the last uh, four or five years, including the, the appalling attack in 77 in 2005 in the London Underground, and, but there were others as well. And 90% of those attacks, according to British intelligence reports, emanate from the Northwest Frontier. The planning and execution of specific raids you know, on uh, civil life society happen from the Northwest Frontier. So, you know, dealing, you know, the problem's not dealt with yet just because the Taliban government was uh, dislodged in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if you could address the <coughs> opium issue. That seems to well, be. Well, you know, um, well, here's the figures. Here's the figures. It's actually a success story, believe it or not. Um, and this year, and I, I, was, I was surprised that no one really made, made more of this, actually. The international community didn't make more of it. This year, opium poppy cultivation has been down 22%. Prices are a 10 year low. Now, you may argue that that's the, the cynicism of not producing it because prices are low. Um, but the key thing is that the number of provinces where, that are now declared opium free um, has gone up very substantially. It's gone to 34 provinces in Afghanistan, it's gone up to 20. Um, from 18 two years ago, and it was, it was half that uh, just three years ago. So there are significant successes. Where the successes have come, it's because security is better than it was, um, and Afghan farmers have been proved uh, willing to, <coughs> even for lower uh, returns, have been, have been shown that they will stop growing poppies, um, providing they can have security and a good market for wheat. So if you, if you, if you build a, a market potential, and um, you provide them with the security for it, then they trade the clip, the obvious hassle of making an illegal crop um, for the, the security, even though the returns are lower. So you don't have to necessarily subsidise Afghan farmers. Um, so it's, you know, it, in some ways it's a win-win situation in some parts of the country. Um, and the other big thing that's happened in 
in the copy uh, story is that it is now a NATO target to take on uh, counter narcotics. And believe it or not, it wasn't until last year. You know, the link is with, I mean, I travelled with British soldiers knee deep in poppy fields in the south. Their job was not to destroy uh, the poppy fields. The US job, um, very significantly, was. And the US believed there was a, there was a, um, an ambassador in, in, uh, in, in Kabul um, who had, had a reputation for uh, wanting to, US, the last US ambassador for wanting to destroy uh, poppy crops, and he argued for it very hard. And it's now not an international strategy, but destroying the people doing it is. So taking on the nexus between the warlords in the south and poppy growing is now a counter, part of the counter-terrorism strategy. So there are you know, NATO forces going out, take, potentially taking on drug barons as well as uh, taking on uh, uh, Taliban leaders. And this is a really difficult argument to have, particularly with the Germans, because the German forces in Afghanistan have not been willing to uh, go out in, into, into harm's way. And suddenly, they're, if, if taking on poppy barons is part of the job that they're doing, then even though they're way up in the north of the country and mostly away from the Taliban, uh, then um, they, uh, you know, then they, they, they might have to suddenly get stuck in. But NATO, the NATO argument was won last year. President Obama has gone alongside it. So you now have um, a, an NGO of, of civilian policy that's sort of mostly working in terms of encouraging farmers where you can to stop growing, and um, a far tougher, and far tougher, uh, and more robust policy against um, the, 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 the people at the top of the, of the, of the narcotics uh, tree. Uh, so you know, some successes, but both the Taliban and the government get a significant amount of um, their resources financing from, from the Taliban, and in, in, and in particular, in, I described how we've not protected middle-ranking uh, Afghan government officials. It's in particular in terms of the customs, the good customs people who have been taken out of the equation um, in Kabul because the relationship between people in the Ministry of Interior and the uh, drug barons has been so, uh, so close that they, when, when someone's come up and actually got in their way, they've generally succeeded in uh, removing but it still, still remains the world's largest exporter of okay. opium. Apparently, perhaps two years long, so <laughs> be careful for all demands. I'd like to, to thank our speaker and welcome you all to the reception we have in the back uh, for more conversation and individual questions. And my book is for sale. And your book is for sale, and please, we have a bunch of them. We'd like to see them all sold.